Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening from wherever you are joining us from, and welcome to our fireside chat. We are very excited to be coming to you tonight and be sharing with our panelists on the impact that the US elections is going to have on the global economy and on investments. But before um, we introduce our panelists, I'd just like to thank all our attendees for being online with us and to remind everyone that this is meant to be a discussion and we really would like you to join in the conversation. So please pop in any of your suggestions or your comments or queries into the questions or the chat box and we'll post them to our panelists. Um, and to start things off, please just let us know where you're joining us from. We have got people that have registered from all over the world and as our panelists are both American and internationally based, um, and come to you from different corners of the world, we'd love to know where you are joining us from tonight. On the Wealth Migrate side, I'd like to welcome Gabriela Farias, who is Head of Revenue and has recently joined our team. Um, she is an American who is living in South Africa. And so we love to get her um, input on what is happening tonight. And Scott, who is needs no introduction and is coming to us from Neisner, and will be the moderator for tonight's chat. So I'm gonna hand over to Scott and he can introduce you to our panelists and we can get started. But we really do want this to be interactive and we look forward to you guys taking part in it tonight. Good evening, Scott. Awesome, thank you very much, Lee. And thanks for organizing as always. I think um, hopefully we, we've all got a lot of value to add tonight. So I wanted to share with you a little story just to begin with. And uh, Brendan, who's on the call, was actually the gentleman. So Brendan was moving to America in March, and then COVID kind of uh, curtailed those plans. And, uh, and actually is living quite close to me at the moment. And so we've met up a few times. And, and what was really interesting, he was talking about a big multifamily investment that he was buying and, and how he wanted to close it out before the elections. And, uh, and, what he, and I'm not going to go into what he said, because that's the purpose of the webinar tonight. But what he said was, you know, if X happens, then, then I expect this to happen with banking and interest rates. And if Y happens, then this, this, and this. And it suddenly occurred to me that, you know, I've helped hundreds of investors, or to be fair, we, we've, all of us probably on this call have helped hundreds of investors, uh, if not thousands of people invest into America. And as an investor, you know, we don't really care technically who wins the election. So I want to be very clear here. This is not a pro uh, Democrats. This is not CNN or, uh, <clears throat> or pro Republicans. And, and this is Fox bringing you the information. Uh, this, is, this is not about that. This is about as investors, what can we prepare for? And so that's the purpose of this webinar. And uh, we're very, very excited to have the panelists. Before I introduce them though, I just wanted to share some things with you quickly. Uh, one of them is that we've talked a lot about Wealth 5.0, and it's so interesting because we, we're very much in the digital decade now. Now, tonight has got nothing to do with this. However, just to be aware, we are running a webinar series, and we've, we've already done uh, three of them. Uh, next week is a webinar on Ray Dalio. Uh, the week after that, or about two weeks after that, is uh, property and the whole prop tech, fintech space. Um, then we've got Society 5.0, and finally, we've got a, another panel. So there's lots of great webinars coming up over the next couple of weeks and months. And um, if you want more information, Lee can, uh, Lee can share that with you. <clears throat> what I wanted to share with you tonight is that uh, just so that you understand who the panelists are. So we've got uh, one international person in Andrew. And uh, Andrew, I did, I did have to laugh. You know, Andrew is a, a, is a, um, he runs a family office and pretty much helps uh, wealthy people, 20 wealthy families um, to, to look after their wealth. And, and if you don't know what a family office is, go and look it up. But why I had to laugh, Andrew, is when I went to your LinkedIn profile, there's you in, in almost an Iron Man suit. And I know that you do these, uh, these really crazy uh, challenges, but uh, anyway, so um, this, this is, uh, this is uh, far from the, an endurance race, Andrew, but we really look forward to your insights in terms of what's happening in the global markets and, and, and what you expect and, and what you're advising your uh, families, your wealthy families in terms of what to prepare for. Perfect. Then we've got uh, Joy. Joy hasn't joined us yet. She's actually funny enough on another webinar that's only gonna last about half an hour and then she's gonna join us. Joy and I have known each other. I met her at the first crowdfunding event in New York in, or sorry, my first crowdfunding event in New York 
in a real estate crowdfunding event in 2014. And um, she ran uh, Leverage PR that was one of the biggest PR firms in the FinTech crowdfunding space. She actually sold that uh, to a listed company about a year and a half ago. And um, is a very, very close, uh, I'd say a close friend and partner of our business and, and equally a shareholder. Then uh, Hilda Lundestead, who is a South African lady, highly successful business lady. She immigrated to Texas back in um, July last year and is terrified to come online and give her opinion because she's waiting for a green card. And it seems every American is terrified of having an opinion uh, with, with the election. So um, Hilda, I, I think is joining us, but I had a good chat with her yesterday. Um, a very good friend of mine, Robert Gordon Brown and I went to university back in uh, uh, just about two or three years ago. You can see from him and, him and I's age that we were at university you know, quite recently. But uh, no, seriously, 20, 25 years ago, we were at university <laughs> together and uh, went to London together. And uh, he's actually um, in the whole investment banking space and more recently um, has been in America, I think since 2001. Uh, married to an American lady and, and is a wealth advisor um, in that space. He's not coming tonight representing the business, but rather as a friend of mine that helps, you know, wealthy people. And, and I really thought it was interesting to get his perspective um, coming live from New York. So, uh, Robert, uh, awesome to have you online. Thank you. Uh, Gabriella, it's, um, you're the only one that's got a round picture because we've, I've actually got you on our profile pictures. I think Lee's already given an introduction. Uh, we're very, very lucky now to have a senior uh, team leader who's actually from America and uh, married a South African and is uh, based out of Cape Town at the moment, but with a huge amount of experience in, in the fintech space and equally, you know, coming from America, uh, very interesting to see what her perspective is on it. Uh, Brendan, as I said to you, we had a great webinar at lunchtime today. If anyone's really interested in the uh, multifamily space, you know, we had a very good webinar um, the, the, at lunchtime today, so I won't repeat everything, but Brendan has got a portfolio of, I stand to be corrected, Brendan, but it's about $250 million of real estate in America, um, not only for himself, but for other investors, and so brings his opinion on what he thinks is going to happen within the market. Jing, Jing actually came through Money Revealed originally, and then, and then Roger Hamilton, and uh, recently joined the team, actually, this month, and is a younger gentleman, but extremely tenacious, um, got an amazing story, actually, because um, I get about 400 emails a day. So I'm sure, like everyone else on this panel, we are overwhelmed with information. But he managed to rise above the noise. And, uh, and, and I've been so impressed by, by his skill set. And he actually joined our team in terms of the whole due diligence research uh, team in uh, the beginning of this month. What's really interesting, though, is a younger person. So it gives us a different perspective from an age group perspective and also from San Francisco. So, um, and I'll go into that in a little bit of detail. And then lastly, Larry, we've got, um, we've got yourself as well. And uh, Larry and, and his family and business is an extremely large uh, property company, real estate company. I stand to be corrected, Larry, but um, certainly managing many billions of dollars and, and many, many years of track record. And uh, not only with all your own investments, but equally with, uh, you know, similar to Brendan, where you've got a lot of other people's money invested um, you know, I'm fascinated with your context of what you think and expect out of the market, you know, post post elections in, in this new world, America. So we really just wanted to welcome all of you. And what I wanted to just say before we get started was you might have noticed that I've tried with Lee very hard to have different perspectives and different geographies. And why do I want to say that? I was doing a bias trip in October 2016, which was just before the last elections. And I went to New York and absolutely people loved Hillary, uh, Hillary Clinton, the Democrats. Then I went to Atlanta and people were like a little bit like, you know, you sort of, you'd meet one person and they were one way, you'd meet another person and they were another way. Then I would go to Texas and they thought that Hillary Clinton should be hung. Now I'm not, I'm not exaggerating my words here. Like literally people were said she should be hung for treason. <laughs> okay. And they were like pro Trump and everything. And I was like, as a, as a foreigner, I was like dumbfounded by how patriotic, and I don't know if that's the right word, but how, how um, aggressive people were on both sides of the fence. And then funny enough, I went to San Francisco and it was the complete opposite. It was, you know, like Trump should be hung and Hillary should, you know, have gotten to power. 
So what, what I found fascinating and what I've done purposely tonight is try and get different geographies. You, you heard me say, we've got New York, we've got San Francisco, we've got Atlanta, we've got Texas. Um, equally, we've got the international component, we've got men and women, and we've even got uh, age group. Um, me and Jing are the two youngsters, the millennials, who will be bringing the, uh, the different perspectives now. But, uh, but hopefully you can see, we've, we've tried hard to get a, a different balance between everyone. And so without further ado, I wanna get started and I wanna start with a video. Is not going to be the nominee, Chuck. I mean, as you know, I'm ahead in Ohio. <laughs> so, Jenny, could he actually win? No freaking way! <laughs> he will be tempted to run, be predictably shellacked. Do not tell me that Donald Trump is in this to win this, okay? He's a sideshow. This is going to turn a three-ring circus into a freak show. He's not running for president. He's running for keep me famous. I thought... This was maybe some strategy for a new reality show. How should Republicans handle Donald Trump? Uh, ignore him. And Donald Trump is not going to be the nominee of this party. Well, I don't think it's likely that Donald Trump will be the nominee. Well, I, I do, based on your theme, believe that he's here to stay for a while, maybe through a few primaries, but he is not going to be the nominee. Well, so I could, uh, I could keep playing that for 13 minutes, uh, to be exact, is how long that video goes on for. And it was all people saying that Trump would never win the elections and then went on to win the elections. So I think the one thing we can safely say is that we don't know who's going to win the elections. And on Saturday, I was speaking to a very good friend of mine, a mutual friend of Robert and mine, um, who's in Florida. And he said that um, the Democrats were hit by 10%. And I was like, okay, fine. And then I spoke to someone, I'm not going to mention their name in Texas yesterday, and they said, Trump is completely ahead in the polls. So I'm very confused because there's clearly different polls and, and it blows my mind. So again, I'm not going to try and sit here and predict who's going to win. But I did want to pivot into what we think is going to be the outcome. And so before I get into the American space, what I would like to do is, Andrew, get your context from an international perspective. How do you see the American elections affecting the global economy? So I'm an investor, I'm invested in America, but not just America, I'm in England and Europe, et cetera. How do you see the elections um, and, the, and the impact of those elections on this global economy in, in, the, in its current state, which is not exactly in a very strong situation? Yeah, so um, it's been interesting because uh, the family office that I represent basically from a South African perspective, has made its mantra to have a large percentage of their wealth held offshore. And clearly one has to follow the, the largest economies in the world. It's where the growth has been, it's where the action has been, or well, certainly in the last 10 years. And this year, as we all know, I won't go down that road, has been ex exceptionally challenging. And these questions, Scott, you're absolutely right, have been put to me over and over again because of the exposures we have to Sectors of the S&P uh, in terms of the stock market. I, I, I'll, I'll confine my comments mainly to stock market, not real estate or banking as such, uh, or broader economic sort of uh, indicators, mainly to the stock market where investments are being uh, sort of undertaken. And the question that has been asked is, um, and I think what, what let, me, let me rephrase that. The biggest concern, the biggest nightmare is trying to firstly understand American politics and how things actually get done, okay? Um, it, it really is quite uh, interesting that as a seat of democracy, one of the seats of democracy, it does actually sort of ring true bells with that little, that sort of circus jingle you had going on with this little video, because it does seem quite, it's, it's quite confusing from an outsider to look at that. And really, I think the one takeaway that I've had in the last uh, three months and we three weeks away, uh, there's a vice presidential election, a vice presidential debate tonight is I think Wall Street's nightmare is that on election day, uh, there isn't really a Donald Trump or a Joe Biden victory. I think if there's no clear winner, the one thing that concerns us intensely and probably in, it concerns American-based investors is um, literally if one side doesn't accept the results and if there's no clarity, the markets hate uncertainty. So it's something that, you know, if there's a clear winner, um, if it's if it's it's undeniable and there's a winner and we move on, uh, the incumbent is not going to make that much sense. I think the 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 underpinning of Congress and the House of Representatives and the Senate and all who controls what to get things passed, I think uh, that is where um, the markets are going to take, I think, strength from if there's a certain winner. And at the moment, 
it you know you're exactly your conflicting feedback of once one person saying this the other person saying that lends us to the situation and there's been you know the rumors have been fueled that well we might not from both sides we might not accept the 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 nomination of who's going to win outrightly i mean this is the first presidential election by post box not by you know not by election box so to speak so it opens itself up to huge uncertainty brilliant robert let's start on the east coast and kind of new york and the sort of sentiments in new york and what are people preparing for again and i'm talking primarily from an economic perspective what's your take on on what could happen either way uh, post election yeah so i think um for me, one of the big distinctions that I try to focus on every day is the difference between being a trader and being an investor. Um, and so uh, I think Andrew's points are well taken. And if you're a trader, it's going to be a huge opportunity. But if you're an investor, um, you know, that period will go down in history as a very tumultuous one. And I think there will be huge societal impacts. But the reality is, if you have money in real estate, if you have money in equities, if you have money in US fixed income, you know, in June of next year, it, the, the framework about which you're going to be making investments is going to be one that doesn't really matter who won, right? You're going to have as the point of today's discussion. So I think the fact is that I'm looking at and speaking to clients about and investors about is the US continues to be the deepest, most sophisticated capital market in the world. We have the deepest broadest private equity venture capital markets. We have positive interest rates. They're very low, but they're positive compared to Europe. Um, corporate earnings are strong. They're unlikely to collapse because of the election outcome either way. And so if you're someone that has a five to 10 year view, you're just going to keep money in the market and you're going to be punished heavily for having cash. And I think that's probably a sentiment that's broadly shared across both Republican and Democrat uh, sort of investors that there may be some little marginal behaviors you can or investments you can make around the election, but broadly speaking, um, when you look around the world, um, you have to have money in the US globally uh, for the reasons I mentioned, and that is going to drive behavior. And I certainly don't see there'll be different sector winners, uh, healthcare versus oil versus technology, but ultimately speaking, a year from now, equity markets will be higher fixed income returns will be positive, innovative tech opportunities will be there. There's probably amazing opportunities in real estate, uh, depending on how COVID works, which is probably a bigger influencer. So I think um, long-term investors are, are gonna ride this out and look at the fundamentals. Interesting, so you see this more as a blip uh, rather than a major pivot in either direction. Yeah, certainly in terms of things that would drive a decision to make an investment. Um, I think it's a short-term blip. I'm far more concerned about high levels of unemployment, uh, a COVID vaccine not being uh, valid or viable or easily distributable, people thinking that a, a vaccine is not valid because Trump created it or a vaccine's not valid because it came up when Biden was the president, if, if he wins. Uh, I think those are things that are going to drive deeper levels of, of ac business activity. Uh, I think the election will, um, it'll come and go and, and by January, you know, investors look forward and they'll adjust to whatever the new regime is and they'll, they'll just be investing pretty much as they did before. Excellent. So Joy, wonderful to have you online. I did introduce everyone else. I did, I did give an introduction to who you were earlier and, and, and did let people know that you'd be joining us a little bit late. So I just wanted to say welcome. It's wonderful to have you online. Thank you very much. Coming all the way from Austin, Texas. Thank you for having me. So um, just, Joy, just, as you, just so that you know, I'm working in a east to west around the world uh, uh, scenario. So Gabby, I'm actually not 100% sure where you came from in America, but I think it was New York as well, was it not? Um, no, so I grew up and lived in Washington, D.C. for 10 years um, and then spent uh, the, my last year and a half in the U.S. was actually in Denver, Colorado, and then moved to Cape Town. So a bit of, bit of both Midwest and East Coast. Well, I'll tell you but what, I'm going to go with Washington because that sticks with my plan, which is uh, we'll go with you next. <laughs> what's, your, what's your take on, uh, what's your take on, on what's happening and, and specifically with what you've seen both as someone looking in from the outside, but someone who's also from America. 
Yeah, look, I, I actually have to agree with with Robert here that I think what I'm more interested in is how the um, how the average American citizen reacts to the to to the election and any uncertainty around that election is absolutely going to result in Americans being uncertain in um, their their um, ability to spend and contribute to the economy, their ability to be able to purchase a home or purchase real estate or invest, um, especially when we look at things like the stimulus. Uh, today, Trump announcing that he's not willing to negotiate uh, in stimulus conversations until after the election, that could play a really big part in how Americans respond in the polls, how they end up voting, and then the outcome of the election, if that stimulus package actually gets picked up and approved, where they put their dollars at the end of the day. Um, so maybe it's a bit of a blip and I, I, in that sense that I think six months from now, a year from now, the markets will will regulate. Um, it may be prime for certain sectors like tech, like medicine, uh, excuse me, medical, but um, the uncertainty in the immediate, I, I think, is a big concern. So. Excellent. So, Larry, moving to yourself uh, down in Florida, and I think actually you and Brendan were, get, were about to become neighbors because, uh, uh, Brendan, you were moving, oh, you were moving to Atlanta, actually. I know you were originally looking at Tampa, but Larry's in, uh, Larry's in Tampa. And uh, Larry, from your perspective, I mean, you've got billions of dollars invested in real estate. Um, you've got, you know, as I understand it, decades worth of history and, and a good family legacy. So I'm sure this is not the first time you've, uh, you've had chaotic uh, situations, even in politics. I, I was actually listening to something this morning about how when Nixon came into power, everyone thought the American uh, democracy was over. And, uh, and, and, and the gentleman interviewing was saying that the good, the good news is the political system is bigger than the individual. But what's your take and what are you, what are you advising your investors and, and equally doing for your own investments? Sure. We look at the direction of future interest rates as a critical item in the real estate business. Our entire business is interest rate sensitive. So in looking at the two candidates and looking at their policies, I would say it's a game of can you top this in terms of who's going to spend more? Under Biden's plan, this is a, a bipartisan independent analysis, there'll be upwards of 5 trillion of new spending on top of COVID relief. When you add in COVID relief, that number goes to 10 to 11 trillion. Under Trump, it's about 5 trillion, only a half a trillion difference, maybe Biden's five and a half, Trump is 5 trillion, and both Trump and Biden have very large uh, potential COVID relief numbers. So you're looking at spending that will actually exceed based upon whichever president gets in will exceed the percentage of GDP that we had in World War II, which was the all time high in the history of the United States. So this tells me that somewhere along the line, we are going to see some really serious inflation. Now I will, be my, I will remind you that I have been wrong about this for the last 10 years, at least maybe 20, uh, because every time we come across a floating rate versus a fixed rate on our on our loans for real estate, I say, you've got to fix it right now. But I'm now even more committed than ever to take every one of our loans on every real estate, every uh, building we own and get long-term fixed rates. And we'll, we actually predict that our debt, our debt can become an asset. Now, that sounds kind of ridiculous, but how do, what do I mean by that? Well, if we lock our interest rates on a big chunk of our capital stack for 10 or 15 years and we get a big run up of inflation, our debt is down here, but our rents start to go like that. And some of the greatest profits, if you go back to the 70s, that were ever made in the United States were from real estate guys that had fixed interest rates in the early 70s. And then we had a huge run up of inflation but they had 30 year fixed rate loans on their real estate. So that's something we're looking at as a very big part of how whichever, whichever candidate comes in, they're both gonna spend wild amounts of money. A lot of people attribute Trump to 
being a genius that he, if you're a Trump supporter, prior to uh, the COVID pandemic, uh, there was about a trillion a year of deficit spending. Uh, before we even had COVID. Now we're talking about three or four trillion on top of that. So during the Trump presidency, we're already up to about seven trillion. Now this just gives you an idea. And then Biden's plan, I'm trying to be as balanced as I can politically on this conversation. Biden's plan uh, is to go crazy with spending on uh, green energy, which is really, uh, it's, it's great and exciting, but it's, it's trillions of dollars. So uh, these are the things we're thinking about. And then ge geography is also critical in terms of how the election is going to play out, because you may have heard something called blue state, red state. Blue is Democrat for those who are international. Red is Republican. So a lot of the legislation that is going on uh, either benefits red states or blue states. So, for example, right now, the stimulus to deal with COVID is grinding to a halt because the Democrats want a large bailout for places like California, New York, which are running up huge deficits due to COVID. And the Republicans are saying, let them eat cake. Basically, you know, they are irresponsible governments running up big debts. We're not gonna bail them out. And then, so you have that issue. And then in 2017, we had the limitation of deductibility of state and local taxes on your federal tax return. So what did that do? So if you were in New York State or California or one of these big blue states, big Democrat states, you were unable to deduct your income taxes on your federal return. Now Biden, want, so that has had a very negative effect on places like New York. So we here in Florida have been a huge beneficiary. We call the 2017 Tax Act, the Florida Subsidy Act. Uh, now Biden, if he gets in, wants to completely reverse that and go back to the deductibility of state and local taxes. So geography has a big impact on where you are. So depending on a Biden-Trump victory, if Biden gets in, the, the blue states will probably benefit enormously, uh, the red states not so much and, and vice versa with Trump. So <laughs> there you have uh, the, the way we're looking at it. I think that was excellent. <laughs> thank, thank you very much, Larry. Sure, that's a hard, uh, I feel sorry for the person who has to follow. And I think the next geography is Atlanta. So, um, but, uh, but Brendan and I actually traveled up to North Dakota many years ago and it was called a red, white and blue state. And I was like, you know, so this is when I first learned about these colors and it was rednecks blue collar and whites only was the way they described themselves in, in North Dakota. So, um, and, and it was quite interesting how this whole blue red state thing, you know, we, we realized in the property game, it was quite important right, right early on. Brendan, from your perspective, you, you, as I said to you, are looking to do a big property transaction at the moment. And interesting with what Larry said around interest rates and all that, because, you know, normally when you're closing a big transaction, it's purely down to when's the money available, when does the seller need it, et cetera. You've had to chuck in a whole nother factor, which is that the elections are three or four weeks away and you're, you're trying to you know, uh, plan around that. Talk to us a little bit about, as an investor again, um, what you're planning for either side of the fence. So uh, thank you for the, for the question. And I, I must say that um, the information everyone shared so far, I, I'm taking notes here like crazy. So I'm learning as much as anyone else. So thanks for sharing so much. And um, to speak to what uh, Rob and, and, uh, and Larry both said, um, so uh, Larry mentioned uh, interest rates and it's a very important point for us because we're doing exactly the same thing as him. We're, we're taking 10 year interest only debt. Um, we're trying to lock it in for as long as possible. And and if we can lock in our debt at 2.9% on a 10-year interest-only period, uh, we know we've got a really safe income cash flow buffer that um, over a long enough period of time, we, we will be safe. And we're also taking a view that, that if you have to spend this much money in terms of the stimulus, whether it's $2 trillion, $5 trillion, $10 trillion, like it, it's just such big numbers that it must create some level of inflation. So I 100% agree with, with Larry. I don't know when that will happen, but we are starting to see that play out in, in markets like uh, Atlanta. We saw organic rent growth of over 10% without even doing any value add type of stuff. You know, So we are seeing 
uh, inflation even before COVID happened. And now with these stimulus uh, packages coming on board, um, I think the, the difference between where the money comes from is going to be uh, a very big differentiator between Joe Biden and Trump. So, for example, Trump's going to borrow the money at low interest rates, predominantly, and Biden's going to increase taxes and fund the stimuluses out of, out of increased taxes. So uh, how that plays out in the markets is, you know, the velocity of money is going to be a big factor because what happened when COVID locked everybody down is we stopped spending money for a little bit of time and we saw the S&P take a, take a beating as a result. Uh, because people just couldn't go to the restaurant, couldn't go to the cinemas, couldn't go to ball games, couldn't go to college, couldn't go to school. They couldn't move around and spend money. And as a result, um, if nobody's buying anything, you know, I just look at the bottom line and say, we can be all fancy with, with really interesting graphs and predictions and everything. But if nobody's actively buying any products, uh, it has to have an effect on a company's valuation at some point. Um, so while the, the S&P has been running up and setting new records and that type of stuff, um, with the amount of money that's now floating around, it's taken some time to play itself out, but it's been a very interesting learning curve uh, to witness. And whether Joe Biden or Trump comes in, um, you know, we also don't like uncertainty. So, so we were taking a view that whichever one happens, um, we're uncertain and therefore we want to close beforehand. Uh, because, uh, w you know, if we get stuck in limbo where uh, somebody's contesting the, the presidential election and now markets are uncertain. And if markets are uncertain, our lenders are going to be uncertain. And all of a sudden they're going to say, oh, our spreads need to widen. We're uncomfortable with the risk. And now we're at higher interest rates right the day before closing, you know. And we bought a property last year where, um, you know, in the last week before closing, our interest rate moved almost, uh, you know, almost a full percentage point. Um, so it was, well, it wasn't quite that much. It was about 0.8 of a percent. So it's quite incredible how much that risk can change. So what we're trying to do right now is rate lock with Freddie Mac on our transaction so that we know what we're getting, uh, when, you know, when we get, get to closing. So even if it does happen to run post, uh, the, the election, at least we know we've got our rate locked in and we're okay. So it's, it's very interesting times. I'll tell you that much. Um, one of the very scary things just to mention that, that worries me is, is if Biden does unravel the, the tax structures that Trump put in place. So in 2018, on the 1st of January, I got one of the best presents I've ever had because the corporate tax rate got dropped from 38 or 39% down to 21%. Um, now, that's a very big uh, you know, drop. And I think that corporate tax rate that played out over the last two years with that extra money that uh, uh, US corporations have had to spend is why the markets were doing so well before and why unemployment was at 3.8 and 3.9% and that, you know, those types of levels. So if Biden unbundles that and pushes the corporate tax rates back up to 38, 39%, I think that's going to have a very big negative impact on the markets going forward because that's a straight bottom line. You pay the IRS and it's done. Brilliant. Thank you, Brendan. So let's move across to Texas and uh, we've got Joy, Joy in Austin and uh, Joy, I had a nice conversation with Hilda just yesterday. So she was giving me a bit of an update that uh, Austin's a bit confused at the moment because Texas is generally very much a Republican state, but with all the, uh, with all the people from San Francisco and all the tech people moving to Austin, it's a bit confused as to what it is or it isn't at the moment. But um, what's your take, Joy, on uh, two, two things. One is just, equally give people a bit of an update on Austin because it's really interesting how much inward flows have been happening to Austin uh, based on based on everything that's happened, even just pre, you know, it was happening before COVID, but it's almost been accelerated in COVID. And then secondly, you know, your, your input on uh, where to from here from an American economy perspective. Yeah, of course. And so um, uh, I recently joined an investment firm that's focused on a couple different areas, defense, cybersecurity, manufacturing and industrials. And we're looking at this from, um, from a few different perspectives. One, one of the major things, themes happening right now uh, with COVID, with all the disruptions that we saw in the supply chain is that 12, um, Bank of America did a really interesting report where they interviewed the CEOs of 12 of the largest sectors with a market cap of 22 trillion and above. 80% of those companies 
U.S. companies have plans to reshore operations to the U.S. So um, it dramatically shifts production, manufacturing, um, those types of jobs have a ripple effect for every $1 sold in manufacturing, you have $1.33 of economic impact. And so that's going to make some pretty interesting changes within the U.S., um, just as far as our overall growth with the supply chain disruptions, it's not, um, and just kind of the way that um, the labor markets are right now, it's not dramatically uh, less expensive to offshore operations anymore. If anything, with the um, logistics glitches that we've seen here, it's, it's causing more issues. So I know that's not necessarily Austin-based. Um, you know, we're looking at assets, uh, primarily like shipyards, um, robotics infrastructure companies, a, a variety of different types of um, com middle market companies that have you know, pretty strong EBITDA regardless of what the current economic outlook is. And we're using it, you know, get leveraged debt situations like that with low interest rates. So I think that there's always going to be value no matter what who wins the election, what the outcome is. Um, personally, I feel like if we can just get COVID under control and if we can start taking it seriously as a country, that's going to have the bigger economic impact than anything else if we can start to really get our rates down and um, there can be a sense that you know we can be responsible again. Um, I, I think that's gonna make a huge impact on the market because you know, I think one of the other panelists said until people start spending money again, you know, there's so many industries from the food and beverage industry to entertainment to, you know, the retail clothing, um, all these, these uh, expenditures people are making that they're just not spending money on anymore. You know, if you're constantly in workout gear from home and ordering your groceries, there's not a whole lot of opportunity. You're, you're not spending as much. So that's no, that. It's a, it's a valid point. And, you know, I'd, uh, I'd love to actually stay online for like three hours and, and, and pivot at some point to ask all of you where you see the world after COVID. But uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's very seldom you get so many uh, intelligent people together to have a mastermind type effect. But uh, let's pivot quickly to Jing. Um, who's, who's all the way across in California and one of those blue states that is hoping that the Democrats win so that it can uh, <laughs> help them. But uh, equally, equally as a millennial. And uh, Jing, what's your take on it? I know you did a lot of research, um, not only for this webinar, but you've been doing research and you've been to a number of other webinars. And uh, what's your sort of feeling on, uh, on, on what you found? Yeah, so... Uh... Basically, living here as a millennial in the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, it, it pretty much is every millennial, more or less, that I've talked to or seen on Facebook, Instagram posts. Uh, to say the least, they probably wouldn't mind if Trump got hanged, just like you said earlier, just like in 2016. And um, on a uh, kind of a personal level, things I found is um, yesterday I was researching a podcast that was done by Tom Wheelwright, who is Robert Kiyosaki's personal CPA. And he basically talked about it um, on a, a tax perspective. I know some of the other panelists kind of talked about the tax, but one thing that I really found fascinating, what, he's, uh, what Tom said is that doing the research, uh, essentially Biden wants to change the tax laws that's been in place for more or less the last 60 years. And this will have a huge impact because of how massive the disruption is. Like for example, um, Biden wants to change the long-term capital gains tax, the same as the short-term capital gain rate tax, which effectively means that it's going to be down to ordinary income rates instead of the 15 to 20% that's going on right now for the uh, long-term capital gain rate, as well as uh, another thing is the fact that um, the big thing is kind of, um, there's a lot of research I did, but to summarize everything, Biden wants to, fundamentally change the incentives of the tax law for business owners and investors and provide social incentives instead of economic incentives, which um, one of the things that uh, I kind of understood is that the U.S. tax code is, is really a series of incentives based on what the government wants done. For example, if the government wants more housing, they would encourage 
depreciation as well as if they would encourage drilling and uh, oil, they would give a tax break as well as a tax credit for drilling. But Biden wants to change that from the, if you heard of the cash flow quadrant by Robert Kiyosaki, the E and the S, which are the employee and the self-employed on the left side of the quadrant, as well as the business owner and investor from the right side of the quadrant, Biden wants to shift that incentive that's going on for the B and the I's to the E and the S, so to the employees and self-employed, which fundamentally could have a drastic um, change for the U.S. Uh, taxes as well as how business as well as investing is done. But on the other hand, um, one of the things that uh, Tom said was his feeling is if Biden wins, he'll have to have a Democrat House and Senate in order to do most of this. And at best, he'll get two years. So um, he could raise the tax rate back to where it was before. But fundamentally, change the tax law would be pretty uh, difficult. So um, that's just uh, my take, as well as just um, the fact that I have some friends on Facebook. And truth be told, I'm sometimes afraid of just conversing with them because of just how they are seeing this whole election. And I was thinking to myself, well, hopefully this election, after it's over, we could have a civilized discussion without having to feel like it's us against them and uh, vice versa. Um, so yeah, that's just kind of uh, my take as well as uh, kind of how I see things play out. And um, on a uh, more personal level, uh, because of the uh, pandemic and I was just kind of bored. So I was looking at some uh, dating apps just for on a personal level, like for example, uh, Tinder, Bumble, et cetera, et cetera. And I find it really humorous to see some of the uh, prompts of, like, like non-negotiable Trump supporter. So these things that women do not want, I was like, oh, okay. That's, that's quite fascinating because that's how strong it is. If you have to put that prompt on a dating app, that that's not a non-negotiable, not like bad hygiene or lazy, but Trump supporter as a non-negotiable. So that's just kind of like the state of the uh, millennial um, mindset here in the uh, Bay Area. Jake, I, I was really uh, interested and concerned where you were going with that Tinder <laughs> conversation, but, uh, but I have to say that that is a brilliant story you gave, because I think for particularly people that haven't lived in America and haven't experienced it, it probably gives them better context of, of how um, important this is to individuals. So thank you for that. Uh, and just by the way, Jing sent uh, Lee and I a whole bunch of research. I think, Gabby, you got it as well. And um, we will share, and, and I would ask Jing, I know you're on the inner circle, We'll yeah. share that with our inner circle members because mm -hmm. you know, it's a lot of very valuable info that if you're happy to share, Jing, I'd love to share it with our yes. inner circle members. Absolutely, please do. Excellent. So let's uh, let's pivot now. I'm going to open up uh, just, just sort of general conversations. And Lee, if you wouldn't mind helping me, if people uh, if people write questions, you know, I've, I've, it's interesting because uh, everyone's given their perspective. But now I want to sort of get into some straight shooting questions, and then anyone can sort of jump in. We've spoken a little bit about the impact of the banks, the lending criteria and interest rates. So what I really heard was that overall, you know, you expect inflation with time to go up and, and ultimately if you can lock in interest rates, that's a good thing. Um, and, and in terms of, you know, the banking and the lending criteria, if, if there's uncertainty that that could change things. Is there anything else that anyone else wants to add around banks lending criteria, interest rates, because specifically, you know, we've got two, we, we're talking property and then we're going to talk the stock market and in the property market, and Larry, you said it perfectly, it all, it all rises and falls on interest rates, really. Yeah, I mean, it's Robert, yeah, I've got a, a sort of view on that that might be a little contrarian, but like we can sort of weave it all together in the conversation. Um, so, so my view is there's no inflation threat on a five-year basis. Now, if you're making a 30-year investment in real estate, I can see why you'd lock it in now. And if rates dropped another half a percent, does it really drive a meaningful margin difference in your business? Probably not. But it, you know, coming in as a financial asset uh, investor, um, interest rates on in my view, interest rates are going nowhere in a hurry. The Fed has the Fed drives interest rates in the short end, and the market takes its cue from that. Um, and, you know, I think it's extraordinarily unlikely that on a five to say five year basis uh, that inflation is meaningfully higher. Um, and even if it did creep on higher, I don't think that materially impacts asset class returns. 
you might even argue that favors equity returns slightly. So um, when you think about it as, a, as an investment opportunity, for me, the, the issue that comes up here is about credibility of the dollar. Um, and so I think um, the most meaningful impact on inflation, and this is maybe a bit of a, a wild card, is if Trump were to be reelected, who would he appoint to the Fed Board of Governors? And his pick currently of Judy Shelton should be a huge red flag. That, that sounds like a political statement, but this is someone who's not particularly well accredited across any bipartisan spectrum, has got some rather kooky ideas about linking things back to the gold standard. There's very few people that regard that as a macroeconomically sound idea. And so you run the risk as an investor of, is the dollar considered an uncredible investment? And I think Larry's point is well made about huge amounts of debt. I would just point to Japan. It's had 230 to 250% debt to GDP for 20 years. It's still regarded as a world recurrency currency, not as to the extent of the US. But I think, you know, if you're the world's reserve currency, you can have rates as low as you like and issue as much debt as you want for our conceivable lifespans. Um, and so as an investor, what you want is you want the globe to consider that Fed monetary policy is run by adults that are competent and can drive the ship. Because it doesn't matter, you know, Joe Biden doesn't have any real ability to, in a short term, change interest rate policy. That's with the Fed. But if you put enough weak people on the Fed, then you have a significantly larger problem. That, I think, drives interest rates that people would get afraid and they'd say to the US, you've got to pay me more to lend for me to lend you money. I think that is, is more likely a driver of higher rates. And that might be controversial, but I'll throw it out there. Well, I'd like to offer a dissenting opinion. Excellent. That's okay. And I think it's a good dialogue. <coughs> Please do. In, in addition to the approximate 10 trillion of new debt, either from Biden or Trump, take your pick. The greatest threat is the Fed itself to inflation. And what do I mean by that? Let's just take real time, my business that I know, which is the real estate business right now. Here we are in the middle of COVID and lots of product types are getting hit pretty hard in the real estate business. And yet, and there is money moving in from all over to say, saying, oh my goodness, this is a great buying opportunity. And yet prices are not going down. And that is due to the Fed driving interest rates down into the basement. So for example, in housing right now, we're seeing year over year housing prices, eight, nine, 10% up because the Fed is driving rates down to such a degree. Uh, Brendan, in your field and in, in the multifamily arena apartments, you can borrow in the twos right now. That's yeah. pushing up to crazy levels, the pricing of apartment buildings. So as you start to get asset inflation, and let's just take the biggest threat of asset inflation of them all, and that's a, a wildly out of control stock market just going up and up and up because the Fed is forcing people into the market. The Fed is basically saying money is worthless. If you put your money in the bank, you're going to get penalized. And that's just driving asset prices up higher and higher. Ultimately, that's going to lead to inflation. The CPI, one of the leading uh, um, components is rental apartment housing. And so as the pricing of housing keeps going up and up, it's going to translate into inflation at some point. You can't keep driving asset prices up into the moon and not have some inflation at some point. Now, all of this actually works out very well for the South Africans on the panel here because gold should be a great beneficiary of, of all of this. And in fact, uh, it recently touched 2000 an ounce for the first time ever. So um, congratulations to the South Africans. If only we could get our political stuff in order and actually take a benefit from it, that would be a separate conversation. But, Sorry, uh, Robert, I had to dissent. I, I, I respect your opinion. The Japanification of the United States is some, some people believe that's going to happen. But I, I think for the reasons I just stated, I, I, don't, I don't see it. No, look, and I think, I think the point is, um, please, uh, the contrarian views are very valuable. You know, if all the uh, 
all nine of us just uh, all walk in the same step. We're not really adding much value to people to be able to have their own thinking. So really, really appreciate the different uh, sides. Andrew, it's, it's interesting because Larry touched on the stock market. Uh, Robert spoke about the stock market earlier as well. You know, it's, a, it's, it's interesting. It's been a very interesting year. I mean, the market, you know, had a colossal collapse in March and then sort of recovered within one month. And since then has gone, you know, from strength to strength. What do you see happening in the market? And, and more importantly, how do investors uh, plan for it? We will come back to property, but, but just as we, we kind of move to the stock market, I'd love to kind of um, play that. Yeah, well, there, there's lots of mantras that go around in, in stock market investing and, and investing and, and trading, you know, climbing the wall of worry, a trend is your friend, and I can bore you with all those type of things. But um, I think the biggest worry from market watchers analysts both quantitative and qualitative has been and 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 Larry mentioned it as Robert the disconnect between asset prices these rising ballooning asset prices in the face of broken economies um, you know when people say the S&P has moved up the S&P is gaining ground it had a great day uh, you need to see what's moving that market and generally it's a it's a it's it's, it's well documented it's probably a handful or a couple of dozen stocks that continually drive the US big tech, for example. But if you look at the, the wider sector in a, in a broader markets uh, sort of experience and analysis, you find they are languishing in the face of broken economy. Um, so is that sustainable? You know, companies were always, um, well, not always, but it's a traditional way of valuing a company is looking at its price against its earnings. Uh, and that, pretty much in many respects has been sort of that book's been torn up and thrown out the window. So the question does beg, is, this, is it sustainable that big tech, for example, can keep going? Um, you know, is it simply as a result of the COVID experience that they've entrenched themselves and become monopolistic? And I think that's going to be a big focus on, on, on in time to come, the antitrust laws and the monopolizing, what have you. There's a lot of noise about that, but uh, we certainly feel that, you know, where are the next sectors? Because certainly um, the tech space that has come out and continues to confound. Um, we, have a, we, have a, we have a Pretoria, a guy from Pretoria running a, a quite an interesting company in uh, the States, uh, Mr. Musk. And, you know, it's, it's, it does, it begs the question, one does scratch one's head when it, it doesn't produce, you know, quarter on quarter profitable results to fail to get into the S&P for one of a number of reasons. And yet it is its market capitalization, which has been momentum driven by investors um, as the darling of, of, of the green energy, um, has got market cap bigger than most of the US automotors put together, bigger than Toyota, and yet produces a fraction. So there are a lot of disconnects in terms of reality that we used to. And um, Scott, we were on a webinar the other day and you actually said to, you said to the participants, um, you know, we're in a world that we're always planning for this, this new world. Well, guys, we are, we're in it. And will we go back to normality in terms of uh, quantifying and, and measuring a company by its balance sheet in terms of its earnings? Or are there going to be a whole bunch of other factors that we're going to have to look at, which are quite, uh, in some instances, they're not very tangible. So, um, you know, we certainly feel, I, I have to 100% agree with um, Robert, in terms of the, the influence of the Fed, um, I've sort of said to clients, it doesn't really matter who's going to be the incumbent in the White House. It's going to be who is making the decision at the, at the Federal Reserve level. Um, but having said that, um, I, I tend to agree with the, the, all the participants in terms of there's this flood of money. There's this absolute sea of money that's going to be spent, um, you know, whether it's by the tax cuts uh, being uh, reversed uh, or these surplus pots of cash that haven't been spent on the, on the fiscal, on the stimulus packages. Um, I think, you know, we certainly looking at um, if, if it's a Biden, if it is a Biden sort of a victory, uh, I totally agree. In a few months time, life will be the same. We'll carry on. We'll be going back to hopefully dealing with trends and things that we used to in terms of forecasting. Um, but I think from an American space where South Africa sees itself looking at uh, the trends that are coming out, I, I think there's going to be a lot of noise around what was Obamacare, you know, which the Affordable Care Act, um, which was the overhaul that um, Obama signed into law back in 2010. 
Um, I think that's going to be very bullish for healthcare stocks, uh, pharmaceuticals, biotech firms, et cetera. Um, whether they're connected to the, you know, the production of the, vi the vaccine or not, I think it's going to be a great area. Uh, Medicare, I think uh, drug prices, at least when it comes to Medicare, I mean, those are, it's, a crystal, it's been a crystal clear priority um, for Biden. I've listened to quite a few of these speech, speeches. And for those of you who don't know, Medicare, well, with the South Africans, I'm preaching to the choir to the Americans. My understanding of Medicare is it's a federal health care system or insurance program for people aged, uh, I think, 65 and older and with certain disabilities. And I think the Biden plan is going to repeal existing laws explicitly barring Medicare from negotiating lower drug uh, prices with drug corporations. So, you know, in that pharma space, there's going to be a lot of action. Um, you know, back, I remember back in the, the I think it was the 2015 uh, election, um, Biotech shares had a huge hit. Um, Hillary Clinton at the time tweeted, um, something along the line that these uh, speciality drug market pr prices were absolutely outrageous. And it was relative to a drug known as di uh, Daraprim. And it went from something like 13 or $14 a pill to I think about $750 a pill overnight, uh, somewhere around about there, an, an un unbelievable number. And she laid out a plan to combat it. And what happened was the whole biotech area not collapsed, but it went plunging down five, 10% uh, on, on the back back of that tweet. And um, obviously what happened, uh, she didn't get in after Clinton was defeated, that whole sector sort of rose up again. So there's got, we're expecting a lot of volatility, whether it's in pharma, whether it's in the green energy space, where I think um, Biden's going to be very busy. He's, he's you know, a, a great advocate of clean energy, rejoining the Copenhagen Agreement, et cetera. Um, that type of thing. I think, Scott, in, in your space, um, the healthcare space, and maybe the guys can pick up on this in terms of the real estate side on healthcare. Uh, we feel that um, sort of acute care hospital operators, um, cycle management in terms of medical space management, um, I think healthcare stocks are poised to, you know, to really benefit from, from a Biden administration. I don't know. I mean, I know the, I know the wealth migrate um, property, you know, um, designed models are, are on the, are on this, in the space. That could be something you might want to discuss as well. Because we see it as very positive. Excellent, thanks, Andrew. Um, Joy, I'm going to jump to you because I'm I'm aware of the fact that you um, needed to leave on the hour. And just for just for everyone's perspective, as much as I could uh, continue for hours with this conversation, I'm finding it fascinating. I do want to respect your time and and sort of also just. But Joy, I wanted to pivot to you so that uh, you would be able to jump off if you need to. I've got two questions. The first question is actually one. Now, just to put in perspective, I did give you a bit of an introduction before. But Joy actually had, like, he's one of the most influential people in the kind of fintech space in America. She was one of the, the founding leaders, and I can't remember the exact organization that got crowdfunding actually passed in America with, through the SEC and everything else. And there's a question here, uh, Joy, and I'm going to ask both questions so that you can just, uh, you know, go through it quickly and, and then if you need to move on. But someone asked a question, which I thought you'd probably be the best one to give us your opinion on. And it was, uh, where's it gone now? uh something about crypto here it is any thoughts on the cryptocurrencies as hedges against the dollar inflation and specifically tokenization of real estate assets so that's the first question the second question is actually a question i'm going to ask everyone so if you just want to prepare and think about it but just your opinion now again we're not giving any financial advice but just your opinion as to not just the election but over the next couple of years and, and things that take into account what are the one or two risks that you think people should be aware of and what are the one or two opportunities? So that's going to be a joint question I'm going to ask everyone, but I'm going to start with Joy, both on uh, tokenization and then her, her opinion on risks and opportunities. Yeah, so from a tokenization of real estate standpoint, um, I used to run a, a public non-traded REIT before switching over to Ascendant. So um, I don't see why anybody would would want to token, I, I don't know, I've never been a firm believer in the tokenization of real estate, just because I think that you can accomplish mainly the same, um, the same thing with a standard, uh, with a standard REIT, um, and with a lot less risk, and you know, you're, you're owning real estate outright, like you can uh, decrease the amount of shares there. So I've, I've personally, um, I'm a venture, and full disclosure, I'm also a venture partner with it, a big blockchain, and um, 
company, uh, Tim Draper's company, Draper Gorm Home, and was just on a webinar about cryptocurrency right before this. But I've, I've never been a fan of it in real estate. I think we already have enough mechanisms there. Um, your second question, you know, I was reading an interesting statistic, um, and I'll pull it up here. In there was a recent report that came out in Globe Street by Apartment List, and 41 of the top 100 markets between now and March have had a decrease in rents. Um, so at the end of the day, what, what's really happening is all these people who are losing their jobs, they're not able to you know, pay as high a rent. There's, um, there's decreases here where the asset prices are continuously going up because of this um, you know, this, this oversupply of money with the low interest rates. So there's a lot of dollars chasing assets, driving up the prices. You're having lower interest rates, but you're also getting lower rent. So, you know, hopefully once COVID is no longer a thing and the um, entertainment workers and restaurant workers and retail workers can all go back to work, we're going to see an increase. But I think a lot of the, um, a lot of the fear right now, especially if you take out you know, some safety nets in there like Obamacare is that you're going to have all these people who are um, more uh, prone to getting sick because they're working in the public. You've taken away a little bit of that safety net. And now, you know, in some cases, if people get COVID, they can have hundreds of thousands of dollars in medical debt if they're uninsured. Um, so it, I, my worry is that um, a huge, you know, gap in, in wealth and the continued increase in that, um, that difference between, you know, between um, wealthy individuals and, and the rest of society is just continuing to get bigger. And, the, you know, at the end of the day, the, we, we need everybody to be doing well because those are the people paying the rents and, and buying things as well. And, and I can stay a little bit longer, Scott, but... Um, yeah, I don't know. That that's my two cents for whatever it's worth. Oh, awesome. Well, Joy, thank you very much. And uh, you know, someone should create a company to help the ninety nine percent be able to invest, like the top one percent. <laughs> well, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. Anyway, but uh, but uh, listen, let's let's then just work with the geography, and I'll, I want to answer this question now, Lee. I'm I'm not quite sure what to do here. I'm a bit confused because there's questions coming in all over the place, and we're already on the hour. So. Uh, and I'm very conscious that, you know, everyone's given of their time here and, and we need to respect people's time as well. So, um, Gabby, let's, let's uh, pivot to yourself. Risks and opportunities and specifically for yourself and Larry and Brendan, I'd like you to focus on the, the property space. But, um, yeah, risk and opportunities uh, going forward. I'll mention yeah, one. Scott, I don't. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, please go for well, it, I'm Brendan. Gonna, I'm going to follow the <laughs> Brendan, just to keep it yeah, easy. No. Sorry, sorry. Perfect. To you, Gabby. Oh, okay, great. Um, look, I, I'm very, uh, very new to the real estate space, so I don't think that I have as much of a platform to stand in as some of our esteemed panelists. Um, I, I do agree with Joy that I see this this wealth gap increasing, and if we want to have, a, in my opinion, a successful economy, we need to be able to provide some type of stimulus or support to those that are directly contributing to it. COVID is absolutely a, a, a huge factor in when that economy will get back to or, or, or will strengthen. Um, but I think also the decisions that are being made in government um, by our governing party or administration are going to directly help dictate when that, uh, when that comes to fruition, if that comes to fruition. Um, so that's, that's my take. I don't know that I can speak to it from a property level outside of to Joy's point, you have the people that are paying rent that need to be able to earn that type of general mid mid to lower level income to be able to, to afford it. So, no, brilliant, thank you, yeah. Robert. From your perspective, um, what's your what's your take on on risks and opportunities? And 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 equally, if you could add one caveat, what is happening in Manhattan at the moment with COVID? Is there, is anyone actually walking around? Is it as busy as normal? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, um, it, it's a little bit better. I mean, I, I live north of the city, so I have I have gone into the city the other day. I needed to take to take my wife to the dentist. Um, so anyway, I went in. Um, there, there, there's people walking around. The activity is much lower. Uh, I can speak. You know, the office building that I work in, I haven't stepped foot in since March, and it's unlikely that I'm going to be there until March of next year. Um, 
all the restaurants are hurting. I have a friend who owns five wine bars. By the end of the year, he'll be lucky if he owns one. Um, that's all of his servers out of work, all of his waiters, waitresses, supply contracts. Um, Manhattan is going to hurt badly. I know of three people who've, I mean, three people at the top of my head, there's probably more who've moved out of the city. Um, rents are going to get hammered. Uh, Manhattan is a very unique situation where this COVID issue is the population density is so high. Uh, there's such an issue with schools. Uh, it's um, the pain there is going to be, I think, very, very deep for a long time. Uh, do I think that's a, a, a microcosm of the whole US? No. Although I think um, if I were to look at uh, what am I most concerned about, um, it's as I sort of mentioned, vaccine doesn't work or people won't take it. Um, I, if you look um, sort of thinking about you know, comments for today, it took unemployment, it took from 2010 to 2017 for unemployment to recuperate to the level seen before the financial crisis. Mm. This, even if it's a, a year or two faster, it's a lot of, a lot of people unemployed, not spending, roll on impacts. But I will say one thing, and this is, um, this is a kind of personal philosophy of kind of observation of living in the States. It may sound mean, but the US system is designed to favor money over people. Look at the way Congress funnels laws. It's based on who spends the most money. Um, look at who's spending the most money and you see who gets to dictate what happens. Look at the way the Fed spends money. Yes, the Fed stimulus helps lots of people. But who does it really help? Holders of financial assets. If the Fed is buying ETFs, it's giving money to people who are selling ETFs and who has ETFs, predominantly people with money. And so I think the, the social unrest that comes from wealth inequality will continue. Biden, even if he wins, doesn't have the capability to solve that even, in, even if he got two terms, um, th there's no, the, the, the system is, is built to, to funnel money towards where money already is. It's been doing it for 50 years. No one's going to change that in the next five. Maybe there's an opportunity to change that over, over longer term. So that sounds rather mercantile and it's not an outcome we would all want, but it means that if you're an investor, you need to be in financial assets. And you need to be, and, and I think on a 10 year basis, you make money in bond stocks, real estate, broadly speaking, you know, it, you know, I think the money's there to be made. So I think we, as investors, we, we need to be slightly different to how we might be as citizens. I'm a US citizen now and I plan to vote and I think we should all be involved in communities to make things better. But the reality is you need to be invested, bottom line. If you, you, the worst thing you can do is sit in cash, in my view. It, it, will, it will destroy your wealth. Even if CPI is only 2%, on a 10-year basis, you've lost 20% of your money. You can do better than that just by being sensibly invested and realize that you know, politicians are only somewhat uh, powerful in the medium term. Uh, the, the forces of money flow are going to drive returns. Um, and, and that's going to be what determines your wealth preservation or growth over the next uh, in a medium, you know, one to five years. Awesome, Robert. Well, thank you very much for your time. If, if you need to duck, I really appreciate your time as well. Um, yeah, and listen, uh, thanks to everybody. I, I really enjoyed this. Hope you again. I, I appreciate it. Robert thanks, everyone. For 10 minutes that he's been on for 70. So. <laughs> yeah, my ability to keep quiet is not a well known personality trait. <laughs> <laughs> that's why thanks, we're everybody. Cheers, uh, Larry, uh, interesting what uh, what a few people have said here and, and even posted. And, um, you know, I've, I've just invested uh, with Feltman myself. And, um, you know, my brother actually asked me, you know, what to what to invest in. And I, you know, recommended you guys. I don't give financial advice. I want to be clear. But uh, I do tend to tell people what I'm doing and people can at least copy what I'm doing if they want to. And um, you know, one of the things that, that is interesting is around the whole corporate rental space. There's, there's two, two really interesting trends that I think are important. One is that you mentioned already, and, and I mean, I've been aware of this as far back as 2010 when Brendan and I were in, were in Florida, is that there's been this mass movement from the likes of Chicago, New York, you know, et cetera, and quite frankly, you know, coal areas to the likes of Florida, you know, and um, so you're benefiting from that generally anyway. And then, you know, we've got COVID and everything we've just heard about and people like, you know, Robert, who aren't going in the office until March. Where, where do you see um, the commercial property space and specifically your sector? Because I think it's important, you know. 
That's a great question, Scott. You know, at the beginning of COVID, I was sort of cuddled up in the fetal position in my bedroom, uh, bracing for impact and in total fear about what was going to happen to our office buildings. Uh, you were reading one article after the other that, that entire massive corporations were going to move all of their workforce to home. Uh, we were bracing for impact in terms of rent collection. We didn't know if anybody would actually pay rent. And um, April 1st uh, in the US is also known as April Fool's Day. So we thought uh, April 1st, which was the first full month of rent collections, was going to be truly April Fool's Day. Uh, but actually what has happened is actually making, my, ma making me scratch my head continuously because uh, I'm in my office right now, by the way, I'm not working from home. <laughs> Just this way is the head of leasing for our company. Uh, she's a wonderful lady, Bahari Larson. Uh, Bahari comes in almost on a daily basis telling me, oh, Larry, we've signed another lease. And I say to her, uh, another lease? And you actually have signed an office lease? And I keep, I've been doing this now for several months because I can't believe that we're actually signing leases when you read the press about how bad it's going to be in the office building business, but we're actually signing a lot of leases. We're actually almost at last year's levels year over year, uh, pre-COVID, you know, in terms of same store sales. And then on rent collections, we're over 95%. And now the pendulum is swinging the other way where we are hearing increasingly uh, Jamie Dimon, of course, you all know uh, Jamie Dimon, the head of J.P. Morgan, uh, made a, a very significant announcement that his young folks, I'm looking at you, Jing, you're the millennial on the panel, sorry. Uh, his young folks are suffering horrend a, a terrible fate in, on Zoom. They're not getting mentored. They're not being part of the company culture. They're sort of out there. And then I think he added, and some of them party all night and sort of roll out of bed and go on to Zoom in the morning. And it, it, it's just not working for the bank. And he wants everybody back in. And we're starting to hear more and more of this. Since I came back uh, to the office, uh, it, it has been uh, like a, a new dawn for me. I, I mentioned this to you last time we spoke. I felt like Tom Hanks in that movie, Castaway, do you remember that uh, yeah, movie, yeah, Castaway, yeah. where he starts talking to his volleyball? <laughs> I was literally one of those people. I was losing losing it. I, I need people. I, I thrive on people. And I think I'm not the only one. Uh, so I, I think the rumors of the death of the office are greatly exaggerated. Geographically, yes, you're right, Scott. And um, Robert's comment about New York is very sad. I am a New Yorker by background. I still have a home just outside of the city, although I live 90% of the year here in Tampa, Florida. I feel for New York because during COVID, mass transit is, is, is the only way really for most people to get into New York. So it's, it's had a double whammy effect where people are not wanting to go back to the office because they don't want to get into the trains. Now we here in Tampa have been preparing for this pandemic for 30 years because we have steadfastly avoided building any mass transit, <laughs> which is of course ridiculous, but that, that is working to our benefit now. So you have this geographic transfer and then depending on Biden versus Trump, if Biden gets in and now you know the probability looks pretty high, um, maybe that'll help New York because they will be back to deducting state and local taxes. But until now, the last three years, we've seen an acceleration of move and migration, in migration into the state of Florida. So uh, that, that's our perspective here. Um, it was very interesting, the dialogue we were having with Robert earlier. I, I don't see um, the Japan, Japanification of, of the US. I, I just, uh, you know, they have shrinking population. We have a growing, still have a growing population, which well, of course is close awesome. to boom like crazy nine months after the uh, pandemic because husbands and wives are 
all uh, in their uh, houses having nothing else to do. And of course, you've heard the joke that what the new generation are going to be called, right? Coronials. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, no, look, Larry, I think, that, I think that's fascinating. And I, I think you're very correct in terms of population growth. You know, Japan's an aging economy going in the wrong direction and, and America is, is not. It's a, um, you know, it's, a, it's a growing population. Brendan, from your perspective in terms of the property market, risks, opportunities uh, based on what you've seen, Obviously, again, uh, just before I go to Brendan, you know, um, the Feltman deals are on the platform. You know, Brendan did a, a whole thing on multifamily today. So we're not going to try and revisit everything he discussed. Uh, like with Larry's webinar in terms of, you know, everything that Feltman's doing, you can equally get um, that available on our platform. But Brendan, what, what is your take on, uh, you know, both risks and opportunities going forward? Um, so, so I think it's very interesting, uh, Larry. Thank you for sharing so much valuable information tonight as well, and and Andrew uh, being phenomenal, and Jing's stories were were incredible. So, so the um, I also curled up into the fetal position around mid March uh, and was completely terrified of what would happen to my business. Um, you know, we didn't know what rental collections would be like. We didn't know if we would be able to sell properties with deals that we had in line or buy properties again, we didn't know what the, what was going to go on. Um, the, you know, the, the biggest risk was tenants not paying uh, on mass. And, and we saw, I mean, I saw uh, stuff coming through on WhatsApp where people were, were coordinating, um, you know, together as tenants in order to, to uh, say, listen, we're not paying rent at all and then hold the landlord's ransom you know and and lots of those stories were were starting to come to me from my investor partners that have invested millions of dollars with me and saying you know what's going on so i had to almost do a daily update to investors um so it got our communication strategy definitely up uh, very very quickly and then what happened is like at the end of the month people just paid and, and we were at i think between 95 and 97 percent of our rental collections in march and then again in april and then something weird happened. We, we did some great um, internet marketing stuff. Uh, we used some good um, technology with Matterport videos and stuff to really start driving traffic to our, our websites for our properties. And we started getting, you know, new leases and, and we said, okay, well, and, and we use a very interesting system with the Audion real page where we're able to price those leases um, based on demand on any one given day, like almost like Amazon does uh, with their pricing structures. And we saw our, our you know, rent collection started going up and we were getting new tenants and the tenants weren't even visiting the property to view them, to, to tour them. And all of a sudden, July and August, we were hitting record numbers. I mean, our rent collections up uh, year on year over 10% on one of our properties and we've done no value add. On, on our other property, we're up almost 12% and we've done no value add in this year. Um, on our other property in Atlanta, we, were, we just finished a a full reconstruction. So we were completely empty and we had to go a full lease up and we're now 50% leased up already. And it's only been three months. So it's, it's been mind blowing to see reality. Just, just like Larry was saying, like I get an email saying, Hey, we got a, a, a tenant and I'm like, Whoa, I'm so happy. And yet it's actually normal. Um, so uh, yes, but here's where I think is going to be a massive risk. So Pelosi wanted to have a 12 month complete moratorium on evictions, which would eventually be devastating because if enough people just stop paying and you can't evict them, you can't fix the problem. Um, so, so I'm kind of glad that Trump stopped the negotiations on, on that basis and said, look, I'm, I'm just not going to entertain what these guys want to do. So I was very relieved when that happened um, because uh, to push helps, through a complete ban on evictions. It helps to have a property entrepreneur as the president. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's like, what do you guys want to do? No, my properties are not going to have that. Um, so, so, you know, we're dealing with the CDC imposed uh, moratorium on evictions at the moment. That hasn't affected us that dramatically. I mean, our collections are still good, but a complete, um, you know, ban on evictions. And they also wanted to do a complete ban on foreclosures because obviously they know if tenants stop paying, the owners are going to stop paying the, the, the bonds and then we're going to have a complete dog show like we had in 2008. Um, however, when, when that did happen, you wait two years and in 2010, 2011 was some of the best buying opportunities in the history of the United States real estate market. So 
you know, while it's a great risk, it's also a potential opportunity. And if we position ourselves correctly and we fix our debt well and we, and we are careful and conservative in our underwriting um, and safe, and don't take, don't overgear the properties. You know, we're, we're taking typically sixty to sixty-five percent debt at the moment, um, and sometimes even dialing back some of our debt. So, so if we don't go too aggressive into deals that are good functioning deals now, um, and wait for those opportunities that present themselves, and I also think the travel industry at the moment has taken a massive beating. Uh, I mean, people that were running j- just on a very small basis, if somebody was just doing an Airbnb and suddenly couldn't, you know, or had to refund people money that had paid and they'd already spent the money and now what do they do, you know? And so there were some very real stories in the travel industry and the travel industry is 9.7% of, of world GDP. Uh, I mean, even if, if uh, countries open up, it doesn't mean anybody's going to get on a plane anytime soon. Like, like I'm getting on a plane with my family on a one flight over and I'll take the risk and I'll deal with the uh, uncomfortable kind of, uh, you know, uh, issue of flying, going through the airports, arriving super early, not getting hot meals, having to wear a mask for 16 hours on a flight to the US. You know, it's going to be very uncomfortable to try and fly, which means, you know, how's the tourism industry going to work if uh, people are just not willing to deal with that level of discomfort? Um, I, I don't know the answer to that. I think there could be opportunity there. But, um, uh, you know, we, 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 we're being conservative in our underwriting. We're being careful with our debt. Uh, we're underwriting our tenants very, very carefully as well. Where do they work? What sectors do they work? I mean, our property we're buying now has got 51% military. You know, a year ago, I would never have bought it because I would have been too afraid to have the U.S. government as, as my dominant tenant. Now I'm super happy to have them as a dominant tenant because they're spending so much money everywhere. They can print as much as they want, like Rob said. And, uh, and, you know, I'm going to have stable income on that property forever. So I'm really, really happy. So that's it. Excellent. Thanks, Brendan. Larry, I, I forgot to say the same to you. If, if you need to duck up, you know, and, and to you, Brendan, as well. Um, and, and uh, I mean, and to you, Andrew, I'm, I'm literally closing out. I'm getting to Jing. And then there's a couple of questions that have come through. And I'm just going to do rapid fire and actually answer them just because I'm conscious of time. So um, if any one of the three of you, Larry, Andrew, or Brendan, just want to have closing comments, you know, let, uh, let me know. And, um, and otherwise I'll be finishing in the next five minutes. So, um, so Jing, uh, from your perspective, you've obviously heard a lot tonight. Uh, you do a huge amount of research. Uh, you're one of the more um, educated people in terms of getting up to speed and following what different people are saying and everything else. What are you seeing as uh, things people should be aware about from a risk opportunity perspective? I think the biggest thing is just being willing to be adaptable and embracing the change because um, the people that I read about as well as kind of listen to seem to be the most fearful as well as anxious are those that still feel like the old way was kind of how it's going to be going forward and not understanding what's going on. Uh, but at the same time, the people that are seeing that this might be a fundamental change in terms of how to do the business as well as everything else are the ones that are doing really well right now. And I'm kind of uh, just on a personal level, the fact that how I reached out to you was I just realized, well, I could either mope around, complain that I lost my job or find a new way to do things. And the fact that you just have to be willing to educate yourself as well and to adapt to change and be okay with the fact that things are going to be different going forward. And either you could complain about it or learn to adapt and embrace the change and over time those are the people that will ultimately succeed uh, brilliant well thank you jing and larry and brendan hands off we are very grateful to have jing as part of our team so um i'm going to uh, i'm going to quickly just say here uh, what impact uh, do you think COVID's going to have on international real estate um you know so i think we've discussed that uh, tonight and and just some of the different sectors that we've dealt with uh, someone also asked about the investments on the Wealth Migrate platform. You know, I'm invested in Larry's deals. I'm invested in Brendan's deals. I think they've both spoken in terms of the, uh, the, the actual returns that they've been receiving in terms of cash flow. Uh, someone else has put in a, um, a whole conversation around the stock market and FANGs versus the um, other, other sectors. And I don't know, actually, Andrew, if you can see it. Um, it says, keep in mind, the stock market recovery has been a K-shape. The recovery has been narrow. 
the concentration of bank stocks has got significantly higher in s p other stock markets in the uk cac are down 15 percent year to date inflation seems to be coming through in the tech stock valuations i think you spoke quite a lot to this already andrew but i don't know if there's anything else you'd like to add to it no it's a very fair comment i mean uh, i think the europe and uk are showing more um you know, it's more fundamentally real uh, and the recovery in the states is very narrow um yeah it's in that big tech space and it's driven by you know the trillion cap companies and the the new age companies that have really showed their robustness but what needs to come through um, is the realism that uh, there is a broken economy there are sectors there huge unemployment uh, stimuluses that can't get passed were agreed by the bipartisan you know the house and the, the house and the senate so um yeah, I mean, one of my fears going forward is this, uh, you know, the politics in the politics in, in the states seems to govern govern business to a large degree. Um, and I think the way to, to get around that from an investment point of view is, and it's something, Scott, that you, that you advocate um, in, in, you know, in, the, in your wealth space, is to have qualified um, diversification across a number of asset classes, you know, not to be constrained uh, in one particular asset class, but to have multiples of income streams or growth streams and the diversification between commodities, equities, uh, everything. So um, it's becoming more and more in point. I think, uh, you know, when Warren Buffett says, you know, investigate every single one of your investments as if it was your own part of your own company. One needs, one can't abrogate that responsibility. One needs to understand um, exactly what one's dealing with and that the pieces of this jigsaw puzzle don't become simply a shot in the dark uh, as a bet. Uh, you cannot have a bet. It has to be a well-researched um, decision you make. Oh, brilliant. Thank you, Andrew. And, and, you know, I love what you said about diversification. Um, I've got the screen up there. You can go to the platform. It is Wealthy Wednesday. And so I forgot to mention that where you can actually get in for lower amounts, um, you know, between Larry's deals, um, Andrew, and uh, maybe Lee, if you could post the diversification link as well with Cashbox. You know, I just, just a couple of days ago invested in a structured note with uh, with Andrew. And again, you know, I highly recommend coming along to the webinar that we did with them. Um, actually, no, sorry, I'm thinking we did a webinar on Sunday, but it wasn't, it was part of the Ann Wilson thing. But uh, fascinating, you know, where, where things are going in the structured note environment. And I think, Lee, maybe we need to look at doing another webinar because they've got a new product coming online as well, which, which would be fascinating. And obviously, Brendan Steele is uh, is coming through, as I understand it, um, and, and nearly ready to go. In terms of um, Manu, you put some fascinating comments here. I'd really encourage people to, in, in you know, be part of the conversation um, on the digital real estate group. You know, that's why we've got the WhatsApp groups and whatever. Let's have this conversation as to how we can share with each other. Uh, Rod Banners asked a whole bunch of questions around. Um, currency and which are the best currencies to be in. Uh, Lee, maybe that's your Wealthy Wednesday for November with James Painter, because he's definitely more qualified than the rest of us to talk about currencies and where things are going. And um, I think really in terms of Nikki Jing has said to you, great advice. And, uh, and then Paris has asked if there are special deals for Wealthy Wednesday, and uh, definitely there are. Um, we always try and drop the minimum so that uh, people can participate on Wealthy Wednesday and today is Wealthy Wednesday. So Lee, that is all from my side. I am apologies for us running a little bit over to not only the participants, we've loved the energy and all the comments to, to Larry, Andrew, Brendan, Jing, uh, Gabby, and, and to yourself, Lee. Um, you know, really appreciate everyone you know, investing the last 90 minutes of your time. I certainly have found it an absolutely fascinating conversation. And you know, when I look at it, We've spoken about inflation, we've spoken about stimuluses, we've spoken about the percentage of the GDP, um, how you need to fix your long-term rates, the fact that debt can become an asset. Never heard that before. That's a very interesting concept, very similar to the 1970s. We always teach people that patterns repeat themselves and what you can learn from history, it repeats itself. So if it happened in the 70s, you know, I did a webinar just, just recently on, on what happened in 2000. You know, the geography and the flow of capital between the red and the blue states, that, that I find fascinating, you know, because, because it will have an impact. Um, what, uh, what Joy said about 41 out of the 100 markets, you know, can't pay their rents. Again, we and no one on this webinar is giving you advice to just invest in America full stop. You've got to be in the right cities, the right states, the right sectors. And, and even if you're in the stock market, you know, equally, Andrew's been saying the same. And then lastly, the thing I really heard uh, from everyone is that the US fundamentals are strong. Um, this is probably a blip, 
And when you look at it over a five to 10 year viewpoint, uh, being in assets, financial assets is really the most important thing. And that would be my takeaway. Um, don't have analysis paralysis, do your due diligence, uh, be able to adapt like Jing said, but take advantage of the market. That's all for me. Lee. Thank you very much, Scott, and to our panelists, thank you very much for being with us tonight and sharing your wisdom and your thoughts. We really do appreciate it. And there were a lot of points as Scott went over and so much more. So I'm sure there's going to be the majority of our attendees re-watching this uh, webinar to get that information. To our attendees tonight, thank you very much for spending the last hour and a half with us. We really do value your time and we appreciate you joining in the conversation. So thank you for that. Um, in the chat box, I did uh, post the link for our upcoming webinars where you can find out more and register. The first uh, webinar that we have again after this one is on Tuesday next week. Same times, uh, 5 p.m. GMT, 7 p.m. Uh, South African time where Scott will be analyzing Ray Dalio's changing world order. So that promises to be a quite an interesting webinar as well. So please do pop over, have a look at that link and join our upcoming webinars right up until the 17th of November. We have webinars almost every week. So thank you wherever you are uh, in the world. We hope that you are surrounded by love. We hope that you are safe. Be blessed everybody. Good night. Thanks, Scott. It's been amazing. Well done, Scott. Well done, team. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Lee. Thank you, everyone else. Bye.